Alex, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So that was the first interactive bit. Good afternoon. Salam alaikum. Lovely to be with you. It really is today. Um, I do start, though, with a bit of an apology. I was going to be here today to talk about executive presence in a very sharp suit, made in London, with a beautiful tie and a pocket handkerchief and a lovely pair of shoes. That was my idea. KLM had a totally different idea. My baggage is in Amsterdam. So I am wearing anything I could buy yesterday to be with you today. So I apologize for that. No, oh, oh, oh. Well, that'll do. That was all. I'm going to sit down now. I've had a round of applause. That's fabulous. We've all been there, though, haven't we? If you travel regularly, luggage will go to different places. So, executive presence, or the insider secrets of executive presence. When I thought about what you would like from today, I thought, I wonder what they think executive presence is. Because that's the question, isn't it? What is executive presence? And if I asked you individually what you thought, in, let, let me try that. What's your name? Amina. Amina. What's executive presence? Um, it's a tough question, isn't it? Um, being the brand ambassador. Being the brand ambassador? Is it good one? Anybody else? Sir, what do you think executive presence is? Brand ambassador. ambassador? Visibility. Visibility. There's all these things, isn't it? It's very hard to put into a couple of words what executive presence is. And then you ask the question, well, is it purely down to the audience? And I think it is, because if you're helping someone to have that executive presence, or you want that executive presence, what will be the sort of things you need to think about? How many people are leaders in this room? Lead teams, quite a few. How many people are going to be leaders in their career? How many people don't care? Okay. At some stage, we all need to influence other people and move them to our way of thinking. Next question, of course, is who has executive presence? Anybody recognize some of these reasonably familiar faces? Yeah? They all had executive presence in different ways. And I want to explore a little bit about how it comes to be. Now, the question I have to start with is... Did everybody start in life with executive presence? The ability to connect and communicate. You know, if we take you way, way back, just a few years. hard not to watch that with a bit of a smile on your face. And my thanks, of course, go to the EMEA, EMEA board of IABC for letting me go to one of their board meetings to film that. But, didn't mean it, didn't mean it. Did we start like that? You remember when you were very small and you had the courage and the confidence to go and talk to anybody in the playground? There were no blockages in between. We could just go up and have a conversation with anybody and it didn't matter. We could walk on any stage anywhere. Well, we didn't when we were small, but we could, if we wanted to, walk on any stage anywhere and feel totally comfortable. What happened between now and then? Yeah? Because one of the secrets of executive presence is confidence, and I want to talk about that a little bit today. I think it comes down to this. How you see yourself. Before you stand in front of any audience anywhere in the world... It's how you feel inside will start the whole executive presence ball rolling. And often people find it... How many people like standing on stage? How many people hate it? How many people avoid it if they possibly can? Okay. Why do we do that? Because when we were little, I bet you weren't like that. What's your name? Yasmin. When you were little, would you talk to anybody? You'd have gone on stage then. If, when you were three or four, they said, oh, come on stage. Yeah, please, me. And then it changes as we go through life. But why does it change? Well, I think it's the way we see ourselves. 
And some of the dangers are we tend to come through, and life is a game, communication, we're all communication professionals, but communication is a bit of a game of chance, isn't it? Who we are inspired by as we go through our careers, who influences us. We don't plan it, they just happen to be there. Now that can be family, that can be bosses, that can be all sorts of people through our lives, but it's a game of chance that we happen to work with them or we happen to meet them or we happen to find and listen to them one day. All these things are a bit of a game of chance. The danger, or the first danger is, we tend to copy other people. Do you find that in organizations that people copy the people above them? They tend to be like their leader. And there's a bit of a danger in copying that it can all go wrong. I love that. It's a great little advert. But it's true. People copy other people, and I know, uh, I think it was Dawn was saying earlier, if you copy people, you'll always get what you've always got. Have you heard that expression? If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. I think that's dangerous. I think each one of us in this room has their own brand. You may have thought about it, you may not have thought about it. But if you have your own brand, how strongly do you stick by that brand when people in your organization are saying, it should be like this? It should be like that. Anybody come up? Anybody use PowerPoint? Okay? Because everybody else uses PowerPoint. How long's a meeting normally? An hour? Because Outlook says so. We follow what everybody else does and we carry on from that. By the way, power, I, I, I'm not anti PowerPoint. I just think bullets only do one thing, they kill people. And the more you see, the, more, the worse they are. Anyway, we won't stop on that today. Having your own brand is about being comfortable with who you are. And let me give you one example of someone who is totally comfortable with who they are. If you heard of Winston Churchill, those are Winston Churchill's teeth. Now why, you ask me, should I come to Bahrain with a beautiful bunch of people from the IABC and look at Winston Churchill's teeth? Purely because, if you remember how Winston Churchill spoke, never in the history of human conflict, like that. He had his false teeth made to keep his lisp. Interesting, isn't it? His brand was so strong that he didn't want to change it, so he had his false teeth made to keep his lisp. Let me give you another demo. Let's go way back. Who's heard of Demosthenes before? Oh, I mean, pardon? Not really, you're pretty... Oh, I was, I was just to come and give you a high five then for hearing of Demosthenes. I like that. Demosthenes, way back in 384 BC, it's a very sad story. No, it's sadder than that. Okay. So Demosthenes, when he was like 14, his mum and dad died, which is very sad. And his uncle, evil uncle... You're very good. <laughs> ...decided to take all his money and all his property and all his, all his income. And the only way of getting your money back in the Roman days was to go to the Roman Forum and orate for yourself, to represent yourself, if you like, legally. Now, poor old Demosthenes didn't have any of those abilities. He was a shy person, a little bit like me. I'm a shy person in a noisy body, it's true. He was very shy and didn't have the skills to go and orate to the forum. He didn't have any executive presence whatsoever. So he decided to change that. And he went into a cave to live for three months. He shaved half his hair off so he wouldn't appear in public. I'm not recommending this, by the way, when you go back to the office, because it might not go down that well. He shaved half his hair off so he wouldn't come out into public. And then he started using some techniques. First thing he did, he had, his posture was wrong. The executive present posture, he stooped. So he hung a sword from the cave until he could lift and feel the tip of the sword. And if he felt the tip of the sword, his posture was probably okay. And he got used to it, and he practiced it and got better at it. Something else he did, he didn't speak very well. He was very quiet. So he put pebbles. Have you seen a film called The King's Speech? Okay, put pebbles in the mouth. 
to try and be better at enunciation. So he did that. And this is going back to 384 BC. And the other thing I like, he had a very quiet voice. So he went to the sea, he went to the ocean, and orated to the ocean until he could hear himself above the waves. Hope then this is not disturbing next door. Uh, until he could hear himself above the waves, and then he knew he was getting to the right area to make sure people heard him in the Roman Forum. And he represented that, and he represented himself, and guess what? He got his money back. Early form of executive presence. So, bringing it up to date. Don't just take my word for it. Executive presence, stroke communication, is vital to all of us, especially for leaders. I won't read this to you. I'll let you read it. Now, as you're coming in, and I'm totally silent, you're probably wondering what the heck is going on in here. It's just a little bit of reading up there. Okay, so that, especially the last one for me, the ability to communicate the most important factor in making an executive promotable. Having presence, being able to connect, is a vital, vital skill. So how do we do that? In our short time today, I'd like to co cover a couple of things that may help. Come on in, guys. Good to see you. Firstly, composure. For those of you who hate walking onto a stage or in front of other people, get the composure right. Feel good about being in your skin. I'll talk about that in just a second. Clarity. Be very clear about what you want to say and how you want to say it. And confidence. Confidence... I spend my life traveling around the world talking to a lot of different organizations about confidence. Even the people right at the top of these organizations have confidence issues. The chief execs, the sweet suite that Kate was talking about a little earlier next door, they all have issues. So we're not alone, because we all have. Those little, you know the little, little words going on in your head? I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. Yeah? We all have those. The question is, how do we deal with it? Well, let's look at composure first. A couple of secrets in this. Firstly, slow down. The energy, the nerves, everything else builds up. So we want to go, 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 go. But that tends to upset people, doesn't it? If I came in and said, hello, I just want to... That's like, that's like in your face, isn't it? It doesn't give you any chance to get you. It doesn't give you any presence whatsoever. It's just too fast. So firstly, slow yourselves down a little bit. It's been said a couple of times, I think Kate said it and Dawn said it earlier, be genuinely interested in other people. Because you all have a story to tell, and how do we find that story without actually stopping and asking people? And I'm looking forward to hearing all your stories over the next couple of days. And I will love that, and I look forward to that very much. Showing that genuine interest. The other thing, I have a little... Would you just do this for me? That's it. Both hands up by the... Yeah, feel free. You're not alone. Yeah, I love the way you checked around with everybody then to see if they would do it before you did. Like, okay? That's how most people see the world. They see the little picture there, and everything depends on that picture. They see the little bit of detail there, and everything depends on that picture. Now just go like that. Try it, not with one hand, two hands, I'm holding a mic. <laughs> then we see the big picture. And I know it's a silly thing to do and say, go like that. But how often in your careers and your lives do people only see the little detail and that becomes the big problem rather than the big picture? Executive presence to me is the leaders who see the big picture too rather than just the little bits of detail. Clarity. Be clear in what you say and enjoy doing it. Be concise, keep to the point. And the most important bit, as I'm sure as professional communicators you all know, create stories in people's minds. Because if you create stories in people's minds, 
they will listen to you more. If you create stories in people's minds, they will get it because they create the picture at the same time as you say it. When I said, uh, and I apologize for losing my luggage, thank you, KLM, wherever you are, um, what picture did you have in mind? You losing your luggage. True, isn't it? And those pictures come straight to us. Confidence. The most important one. We're not, when we were little, back to when we were little, we had all the confidence in the world and slowly it gets knocked out of us. And we allow the little voices in our head to just get in the way. What's the counter to that? Is creating a confidence mindset. Use techniques to build your confidence. Now, I deal with some very interesting people who run huge conglomerates all over the world. And if we're having a small conversation one-to-one, -one, they will admit there are times when they don't feel confident. But it's the same for every single one of us, isn't it? It's how we deal with those times are the important things. So collect a few techniques to do it. Understand those emotional demons that get in the way and say, you're rubbish, you can't do this, no one will listen to you, they won't take any notice. Because underneath it, there's only one person can control that, and that's us. I call them the what-ifs. What if I do it wrong? What if I say it wrong? What if I look stupid? In that case, I'm not going to do it. And that stops opportunity. Because the opportunities are out there, all you have to do is go for it. So, a couple of little secrets in the ten minutes we've got to... I believe ten minutes is. Someone tell me when I'm out of time and we'll finish-ish. Um, first secret. Own the room. Small story. I was in San Francisco. Americans. We have some Americans in the room. Do we? Where are you from, sir? Indiana. Indiana. Have you heard of a guy called Bo Eason, who's an NFL linebacker? Yeah? Bo Eason, NFL linebacker, big, tough guy. And he wrote a play, a one-man play, which he was then invited to perform off-Broadway. Now imagine you're an NFL linebacker. Just, just go like that. Just. Go on. No, right. Imagine you're an NFL linebacker and you've got to go onto a stage of a theater, which is so far out of your normal comfort blanket. So I said, what do you do? He said, John. He said, I paced the room like a leopard. And I paced around the room and I touched the furniture and I touched the walls. It worried me that leopards and big cats tend to mark their territory. I hope he didn't do that. But he did that. And I thought, what, a, what an interesting proposition to change it in your mind. So here we go. Inside the secret number one, own the room. Every time you're walking to an important meeting or you're doing a presentation, own the room. Change the room in your head to yours, not theirs. Because our minds look at us going in there. You know Daniel into the lion's den? Yeah, we're the little one, they're the big ones. Change that in your head. When you host people in your house, what do you like? Friendly? Warm? Considerate? Be that when you're in one of those situations. Host the room. Own the room. Because then I promise you, you can go into any room anywhere in the world and feel totally comfortable about being there and being with those people. First part of executive presence, own the room. Second secret. Um, I make up words. This is a word that's not in the English language. It's called pedestalization. I told you it's not. And this is the man who taught me about it. Now, this is the interesting thing. For international audiences, does anybody recognize who he is? Straight away. Oh, who? Meatloaf. You took the words right out of my mouth. For anybody who knows Meatloaf, that's an in Meatloaf joke. Anybody not know Meatloaf? Quick show of hands. Okay, he's a rock star. Have you heard, like a bird out of hell, do you know that song? No, fair enough, okay. Um, we might have to sing some meatloaf songs. He's a fantastic rock star. And I was a young journalist sent to interview this huge rock star. And I w walked to the door and his tour manager came out and through this sweet smelling smoke said, you have two minutes, no more. I'm thinking, two minutes? What can I ask? Three questions. So I walked in. My first question, I said, what do I call you? He said, my friends call me Meat. Bit weird. I asked my three questions, and then he said, 
what else do you want to know, John? And do you know what I said? Absolutely nothing. Because I couldn't think of anything to say. Because I'd put him on a pedestal and I'd push myself down. He was really important. I was down there. And I thought, I'm never going to do that again. And what's more, I'm going to give it a name, which is pedestalization. So whatever you do, don't pedestalize. Because if you want executive presence, walk into a room thinking, I'm here, I'm not sure. Exactly, it's true. So don't do that. So, briefly, inside the secret number three, little technique I use. Two buckets in your mind. One bucket is chore. One bucket is excitement. Where do we put most things? That, sorry, that was an interactive bit. Let me do that again. One bucket with chore, one bucket with excitement. Where do we put most things? In the chore. And we do it subconsciously, you know? So subconsciously, we're putting it in there, so therefore, it's a problem. You know when you wake up on a morning and you think, wow, come on world, bring it on? Don't you feel good? It's in the excitement bucket. You know when you wake up in the morning and say, oh, I've got to go to work. Another day. Chore bucket. And what's more, we've done it without thinking about it. We've moved it from excitement to chore without even thinking. So, my suggestion here, think of the two buckets sometime in the next few weeks and say to yourself, am I putting stuff in the chore bucket? Am I putting stuff in the excitement bucket? Because executive presence and the people who practice executive presence put stuff in the excitement bucket. So are you excited? Yes. Let's try that again. Are you excited? Yes. What was your name again, Susan? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Brett. Brett. Yes. Would, you, would you just demonstrate, Brett, how an American audience reacts when they're excited? All right. On the count of three, I'll make it really easy. One, two, three, now. Yes! That is a round of applause, doesn't it? Okay. Now it's, now it's your turn. Are we ready? Show me, please. I'm going to take, I'm going to put this on our, our app, on the Hoover app. Okay, I'll go down here so I can get everybody in. Right. On the count of three, please, show me what an excited audience looks like. Three, two, one, now. Yeah! Now, can we do it again with feeling? <laughs> Like Brett did really well. Three, two, one, now. Yeah. That's lovely. I'll put that on Hoover. You can all look for yourselves in there. <laughs> Creating the right mindset, being in the right place. Right. How are we doing for time, by the way? We've got another about five minutes ish, is that right? And everybody looks at their watches. Uh, the other problem, I'll be really honest, in my luggage in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, there is a charger for my watch. So I spent all morning looking at my wrist. And there's nothing there. I need to go back to old school and have an old-fashioned watch. Right. I'm going to show you something, very briefly, interactive. I'm going to show you a picture of five people. And I'm going to ask you which one out of the five you would employ. I'm going to show you it for about five seconds. So pay attention, because it's going to come up and it's going to disappear. Okay? So... In five seconds, I want you to decide which one you'd employ. Imagine it's one, two, three, four, five, left to right, okay? One, two, three, four, five, left to right. Are you ready? Yes. Where's that excitement gone? Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Okay. Got it? Do you want it again? Oh. Okay. Are we ready? One, two, three, four, five, left to right. Choose which one you would employ. Okay, you don't have to employ any of them, Brett, if you don't want to, but on face value. Now please put your hands in the air. A like, bit like that, All right? This is when they walk past the room and think, what the heck is going on in there, right? On the count of three, please put the number of fingers up of the person you would employ. On the count of three. Not yet. One, two, three, now. So what do we got? Ooh. Four, 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 one. Four, four, three, four. Okay. I think the fours have it. Very briefly. Okay. Now, little experiment. It was for a couple of seconds. Yet you made a decision, a conscious decision based on that. So who voted number one? 
Why would you go for number one? She's different from the other girls. In, in what way? She's wearing a white blazer. Okay. Answer to any job with your organization, wear a white blazer, cracked it. Yeah, fab. Number two. Who voted number two? Why do you want number two? He's got a look of anticipation. I think he's actually wet himself, but I'm not quite sure about that, really. Um, okay, number three. Oh, couple of cat. Why? Confident preparation. Anybody not go for number three? Sorry? She looks snooty. She looks snooty. That's a lovely British word, isn't it? Snooty. Will you explain what snooty means? She's looking down. She looks arrogant. She's the person you don't want to work at the desk next to you, really, isn't she? Okay. Number five. Anybody number five? Sir. Yeah. Number five, yeah. Why? Why? Mum, I think he looks like he's taking it seriously. Okay. Anybody think he's a little bit too nervous? No? Take it seriously. Like, this, is, this, is, this is not an experiment that will ever be written up as a, as a, as a future sort of reference point. And number four. Who, who voted number four? The majority of people vote number four. Why? Okay, that was on five seconds. You presumed confidence. She's given you eye contact. That's <laughs> how important it is. There's a large retail organization I work with in the UK, and I said, tell you what, for every person who goes to the checkout, ask the checkout operator to write down the color of the eyes of the person. Because then they have to make eye contact. And when you make eye contact, it's so much more important. Okay, very short of time, a couple of things. Work on the body language. Insider secret number five, probably as communications professionals, we don't need to know this, but... To be yourself in a world that's constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. People with executive presence don't try and be someone else. They're very comfortable in their own skin, and they just develop and build on that. Picture taken? Almost. You're, you're tweeting. Well done. At John Hammond tweet. Uh, be interested. And that's one of my favorite quotes in the world. It's Maya Angelou. I've learned that people never forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And the best leaders in the world, the best communicators in the world, the people with executive presence make an audience feel different and feel good about being there too. So that's Maya Angelou and a great quote. I've enjoyed spending time with you today. I'm going to be around for the next couple of days. If there's any questions, please feel free to come up and have a chat, because I'd love that. And my various details are on there, so contact me as well. That would be good. Thank you for your time. In Quick question before we go. Are you excited about the rest of the day? Yes. Now, can we do this about three times as loud? Because I want it to travel two walls through. Are you excited about the rest of the day? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time.